is peace. Here is the England of 1939, the serenity of its lovely countryside derived from centuries of graceful living. And in Australia, a young, vigorous people, enriched by nature's bounty, advanced towards the sun of great destiny. Here, men march in sport, but in Europe, men march a different step. A disillusioned people is inflamed by the gospel of the high priest of hate. On Adolf Hitler falls the black cloak of Kaiser Wilhelm. Under the crooked cross, the gangsters of Europe plot the greatest propaganda campaign of lies the world has known. Vaingloriously, they strut before the dazed conscripts to a terrible cause. Humanity trembles on the brink of war. Sensationally comes Munich. Goering exults. So did Judas. Men march. Tanks rumble. Europe sees the new hatreds boil in the mud of centuries of hatred. September the 3rd, 1939. Germany strikes hurls total war upon Poland, and Britain is plunged into the inferno of the Second World War. The call goes into the far corners of the empire. It's the Klan call. A mighty empire of 500 million responds. A formidable new Australian army is marching. An army with a tradition. Gallipoli, Palestine, France. New Zealand's in action. The immortal name of Anzac is reborn. From India, from the wide prairies of Canada, from the belts and the mines and the forests of South Africa, men come clamoring. Democracy marches on. Great transports take with them our pride of today, our hope for tomorrow. They take our youth. War at sea. Proudly the German Navy hoists its ensign. War on merchantmen, war on women, war, yes, even on children escaping from war. But Britain has a bulwark the mightiest, the most efficient navy the world has ever known. Destroyers, lean greyhounds of the deep, range the seas, remorselessly hunting down the U-boats, back to the depths that spawned her. Britannia rules the waves. The navy vainly seeks an enemy whose surface craft all skulk in port, all save one, the Grass Spay. But His Majesty's ships Exeter, Ajax, Achilles, outgunned and under-armoured, corner her in one of history's most thrilling naval actions. and beaten, she crawls into Montevideo, where her captain awaits the high command's orders. When he'd executed those orders, he put a bullet into his own head, for this German had a conscience. Outside the harbour, the British reception committee awaits, and the grass bay puts to sea. Will she fight her way out? She won't. The Nazis face defeat, defeat with honour, and they choose the coward's way out. The grass bay becomes a funeral pyre of German naval tradition. London hails the crew of the Ajax. In these men, the spirit of Nelson lives again. In the men of New Zealand, too. Proudly, the Dominion welcomes home her heroes of the Achilles. The Grass Bay scuttled. What contrast with the men of the Royal Pindy, or the heroes of the Jarvis Bay, who fought a pocket battleship alone. The hurricane of Nazi invaders pour through Norway. Britain, France, rush to the aid of yet another martyred nation. Outnumbered and operating from distant bases, the Royal Air Force smashes troop concentrations. Blasts lines of communication. Accepting appalling risks, the Navy storms enemy bases in the Narvik Fjord and comes to grips with the Nazis. Norway holds proud and grim memories for we British. Grim memories that only the total extermination of Nazism will efface. Hitler strikes again. Like a bushfire out of control, Nazism sweeps through Holland, Belgium, France is buckling. The Italian jackal, sending an easy kill, attacks her flank. Britain alone faces the totalitarian monster. Civilization is in the balance. Freedom lies bleeding. Through blazing villages, along roads choked with refugees, through the ruin of a country, the British army in retreat fights the most courageous rearguard action in the history of modern war. While the Navy pours in a heavy protective fire, while the enemy air armada in the skies rains down tons of explosives and is met in gallant combat by the fighters of the RAF, the gigantic exodus goes on. No rabble in retreat this but a disciplined army fighting its way home. 
furiously with every terrible weapon at their disposal, the hordes of Hitler seek to smash the British army, to crush it forever. Dunkirk sails a new British fleet, the queerest armada the world has ever known. Little ships to whom England has called in her desperate hour. Excursion steamers, pleasure launches, grimy tugs, daring all to save so much. The last battalions leave the bomb-torn beaches. The earth shakes under the fury of the baffled Nazis' efforts to break through the last thin line of defenders who stay to fight and to die. They won victory and defeat, for they died that we might live. Through the fiery curtain of total war shone the great white light of courage unimaginable. It shone in the hearts of the men of Britain. It shines now and will forever. For the British Army remains the British Army. And it will be going back. Great ships of the French Navy escaped the grip of the Nazis to join the British fleet to carry on the age-old battle for the liberty that is their fierce pride. General de Gaulle, brilliant soldier, raises the banner of free France. All over the French Empire, patriots rally. Politicians may sell their country into slavery, but the men of France will fight on until she is freed forever of her chains. HMAS Sydney, pride of Australia, hot on the scent of battle. The Italians have come out, headed by the Bartolomeo Colleone, fastest ship of her weight in the world. Leaping to their stations, the Australians open a battle of which this is a vivid film record made aboard both cruisers during the fury of action. Smoke screen, Mussolini's secret weapon. The Italian is heavily hit, sinking. The fastest cruiser in the world is not fast enough to avoid Australian gunners. The sunken cruiser's escorts scuttle for home. Captain Collins and the men of the Sydney carry on the tradition of a fighting name. Bravo, Sydney! The armor from that, the auto bastamenti da guerra inglese, che non existeva. For the benefit of our English listeners, that means that we and our great German ally have sunk eight more British battleships than they ever had. Viva il Duce! The Mediterranean is an Italian lake, says Mussolini. But he doesn't like sailors more than his shirt. War clouds now, lifeline of the British Empire. Its defense may yet become the turning point of the war. Awaiting the legions of the strutting Duce is the Anzac army, fighting sons of fighting fathers. Pity the enemy who faces them when again is given the order made famous on Gallipoli, advance Australia. On far-flung fronts, Britain fights for her life. Every week, every day, gives her new and greater strength. For Britain has friends. We will extend to the opponents of force the material resources of this nation. From America's arsenals, from her factories, even from her own services, come vital supplies for England. Swift air cobras, amazing fighter planes built to strike with the speed and ferocity of a snake. And the 500 miles an hour Lockheed Pursuit, the fastest plane in the world. Flying fortresses, long-range bombers of terrific hitting power. Machines, munitions, ships, 50 destroyers that today are hunting down U-boats. A friend indeed. The British blockade, a steel chain to strangle the life out of the Axis. Hitler must break it or perish. The world waits breathlessly as all his forces of destruction are prepared for the final stroke. The battle that Hitler must, yet shall not win. The battle for Britain. Since 1066, no enemy has gained a footing on English soil. And by the grace of God and the iron will and indomitable courage of the British people, none ever shall. The army that was to have been wiped out at Dunkirk stands to arms, ready, yes, and willing. For the defense of a beloved and embattled motherland arrive the legions of the Dominions, Canadians, peak-hatted New Zealanders, men of the Indian Army, Australia's noblest. The nation's testing time draws near. From congested areas, first marks for Hun bombers, children are evacuated to the country. The balloon barrage, 
the British innovation the Hun scoffed at. But when Nazi pilots, after striking balloon cables at 300 miles an hour, began landing without parachutes, those who came to scoff remained to pray. British workers are magnificently giving their all, and to the workers of the Empire has gone Labour Minister Bevan's clarion call. Your comrades stand at their machines here with their lives in their hands. Give of your utmost. His words do not fall on deaf ears. The white cliffs of England, the ramparts of civilization. If they should fall... England expects that every man will do his duty. Blitzkrieg. Wildly Hitler lunges at Britain. Wave after wave of bombers fill the sky on a mission of mass murder that only the warped brain of a madman could conceive. Convoy, the merchant ships that maintain England's lifeline, meet the first blast of total war from the air. The alarm and the spitfires are coming, flashing out to do battle with the hordes from hell, clawing from the skies the forces of destruction. Never will the camera record more thrilling scenes than these. You're looking at the real thing. of a hundred planes. The blazing courage of the pilots of the Royal Air Force is irresistible. Youth meeting death six miles up in the sky with a smile. In the history of the world have so many owed so much to so few. In one day, Goering's Luftwaffe has lost 187 machines, many hundreds of airmen. Nazi wreckage litters the shores of an unconquerable country. Hitler has tasted the first bitterness of defeat. The wings of Germany have been clipped. Britain retaliates, blow for blow. Over Germany's far-flung industrial centres, the might of the British Bomber Command is spread. From the skies rain down thousands of tons of high explosive, smashing down German war industries, striking at her vital oil depots, her transport system, her troop and shipping concentrations. Britain has inflicted far more damage on Germany's vital industry than her own has suffered through enemy action. Britain is taking it, but she's also handing it out. Every pin represents a devastating raid, and it's a pretty sight to English eyes. The dictators are being hit where it hurts, and they're stung to new ferocity. Hitler issues the most frightful order in history. London must be destroyed. He flings the massed might of his air force at the heart of empire. Total war upon every English man, woman, and child. Indiscriminate bombing to break the morale of a people who don't understand the meaning of the word defeat. Death rides the skies as a huge Nazi air fleet swoops from the clouds over the channel. It's the crucial hour. Upon England, fighting grimly back, falls the pent-up hate of years. The quality of mercy. And man's inhumanity to man. London is suffering, suffering terribly, suffering now, this minute. Only by the grim reality of vivid screen portrayal can we begin to realize what she is suffering. It's not enough that we who live in peace are lost in wonder and awe at the fortitude and magnificent courage of the British people. We must help, help with every resource we've got, with our wealth, with our labor, with our brains, with our hearts. The citadel of civilization must not, shall not fall. Patiently they wait their turn for their chance of safety, the young and the old falls on London, and a nightmare of noise as thousands of anti-aircraft guns throw up a tremendous barrier of fire. Flames from blazing buildings cast an eerie glow over the battered but unconquerable city. To quench them, thousands of men toil with sublime disregard for danger. The forces of savagery have done their worst, and London stands. Hurt, yes, but it stands. All clear. 
It's over. Till they come again. London counts the reckoning. The dead, the injured, and the missing. War. Total war. All because a madman wants to conquer the world. This was a church. This was a hospital. Ruin, desolation, death. Of such is the kingdom of Nazism. The figure of Milton lies prone. But Milton's spirit, which is the spirit of England, flames anew. They carry on, working, tirelessly working, for the defeat of the Hun. The people wearing the red badge of courage inspire the civilized world. Under the Blitzkrieg, a new democracy is born. If ever a people had a common cause, the British have won today. They're fighting the battle for an empire. There'll always be an England. No power on earth can destroy it. Its buildings, yes, its bridges, its towns, its cities, but never the unconquerable spirit of the British people. But this is indestructible. London, heart of the world, home of heroes, peace you cherished will come again, and the everlasting soul of this England will go on down the broad highway of infinite time, trusting in God, in truth, in freedom. God save the King!